My name is Ken Burtness, and I'm coming to you from Holly Eve out at the North Shore. Our show is called Finding Happiness in Hard Times. And today we have a special program for it called The Joy of Performing. And with me today is my good friend, Mary Gonzalez, from all across the country over in Tampa, Florida. Welcome to the show, Mary. Thank you, Kenneth, and hello to everybody out there. <laughs> Mary uh, is an actress, she's a singer, and she's a dancer. And uh, I've always been in awe of her. Uh, she's done an incredible number of shows uh, in multiple languages, and uh, it's just amazing. Where I'd like to start, Mary, is uh, at the beginning of this very successful career of yours. Uh, your first shows and the first actual time that you did a show, uh, and you know, around those areas, because that's the thing that's daunting to most people. I know it was to me. And a lot of people I talk to who are interested in joining a theater group or trying out for a production, they say, this is pretty scary. I, I don't know if I can do this. I get, you know, I get paralyzed. I get frozen. And uh, so sure. it is daunting. So maybe you could start us off and tell us how you made that big leap into trying out for plays and musicals. Well, the, the first thing that I did was where well, you met me at the supper and they had four singers already, and I'm really a singer, I'm not a dancer. However, I had to learn choreography and I had to be a dancer because I was doing backup for the four singers. And that's how you met me. But I'm really not a dancer, I'm a singer and an actor. But anyway, whatever, I, I can learn choreography. So that's where I started and I loved it. So then I went to work in the chorus of what was then known as the Spanish Little Theater. Um, it, the director and founder of that company was the producer and the director of the shows at the supper club where I work. And so he asked me if I was singing the chorus and I, and I did, and I enjoyed it. And I did that for about mm, a year, year and a half or so. And then one day we were doing, we had two weeks left to rehearse the Sarsuela, which I'll talk about later what Sarsuelas are. And um, the second soprano lead decided that, she couldn't do it for one reason or another. And I happened to be standing right there. And he said, can you learn it? I said, I can learn it. So that's how, that was my first speaking part. And um, I did a few little things like that. And it wasn't until a couple of years later that I actually got a lead in the show. So that's really how it started. And it was all Spanish language because I'm fluent in Spanish and I was able to, to perform in Spanish. So I did at first. But uh, let's let's uh, start with the Spanish uh, theater because you're you're there, and uh, I know yeah. you've done a lot of performances in Spanish as well as English. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's that like to perform in a uh, you know a non English uh, production. Well, we had uh, a regular audience that would come to us. They were some of them were had been were Cubans that had come over during you know the Castro period. And some were Mexicans and South Americans. And so we had a regular audience that would come to see our production. And so what we did was, I want to say, three or four years later after that, uh, we started seeing that in South America, they were doing Broadway shows in Spanish. <gasps> My goodness. So we researched that. And um, I say we, and I'll tell you why later on why I say we. The theater researched that, and they decided to do a Broadway show in Spanish. So we actually uh, premiered Fiddler on the Roof in Spanish in the United States. It had been done in Mexico and in Spain, but never in the United States. So we premiered it. And imagine how long ago it was that I played Hoddle, okay? So that's <laughs> how long ago that was. Uh -huh. And so we did that. That We would do that like one, out of, the sh one of the shows out of the season would be something like that. And then the next one we did like that was Sound of Music. And I did Maria in Spanish, and Sound of Music. And then after that, we did uh, Man of La Mancha. Oh my God, we'll, we'll talk about that later too. But we did Man of La Mancha in Spanish only. And we brought this baritone over from Spain to do Quixote. And it was just marvelous. What a wonderful flavor in Spanish. Just wonderful, you can imagine. Cervantes in Spanish. It was wonderful. So it was magical. Then 
we said, well, what about if we do English and Spanish? So we did King, well, first of all, we did King and I in Spanish only. But then the next time we did King and I, we did King and I one week in Spanish. And the next week we did it in English with the exact same cast. Imagine a two and a half hour show one week later in another language. And we did it. So then we decided we're going to transition. And we did, kind of, sort of. Now we'll go with that afterwards. Well, that's terrific. You know, I think one of the things that's really impressed me in the last number of years is uh, our increasing interest in this country in cultures. And so we're getting a lot of multilingual uh, productions going on, which you were way ahead of the uh, of the mainstream with that. and. Uh, it's just turning people on to the joy of, you know, being in other cultures and understanding other cultures and seeing performances. Uh, last, uh, our last show, uh, I had on uh, Elima Stern, who did some uh, Hawaiian chanting to us, and uh, she chanted in Hawaiian. Uh, and we've been doing a number of things on island in Hawaiian and in pigeon. Uh, so, uh, you know, and we're not the only one. Uh, I, like I said, I think there's a cultural renaissance, and uh, I just think it was marvelous that you were able to do this to audiences, uh, long, you know, starting you know quite a bit ago and continuing it on to today. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about yeah. uh, Cuba because you also did some, uh, you know, you, you geared up some shows toward Cuba, and I thought that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, somewhere along the line, I have some pictures here about that. Um, the, we had a series that we called Así Cantaba Cuba. That's the way Cuba sang. That was before Castro. Now remember, Cuba was the pearl of the Caribbean. And everything that came from Spain or South America or Mexico or, or Puerto Rico or Dominican Republic all went through Cuba first. So anything that they sang in those countries was again recorded and sung in Cuba. So we did a series that we did it every single August for about 20 years. We would change, of course, it'd be 30, 35 numbers, and we would change um, the numbers every year, of course, but we would, it would only be music that was sung in Cuba before Castro, before 1960. So it was a wealth of music, and we were able to use a lot of the different, like Spain, and we were able to use Mexican things, and Puerto Rican music and Dominican music and just beautiful stuff. So we, there was a wealth. We never ran out of things to use or, or lineups that we could do for that. We did that for about 20 years. There were three main singers, but every year we would either get one or two more sopranos to come in and do a couple of numbers or a tenor and a baritone or whatever. One of the pictures has me with four men. That was a fun year. <laughs> so, I mean, they, that was fun. Anyway, there were there were just different. There were three main people all the time. I was one of them, but there were always different people that would come in and they would add to the show different segments and different facets and so forth. Because there were legit voices and there were you know voices like my voice, which is you know uh, just a songstress type voice, and uh, so it was it was a beautiful thing. Then we did that for like about twenty years. The other long thing that you did was at the Florida State Fair, uh, which I was uh, certainly yeah, interested in. Yeah, that was my, over like 27 was years. My right? 27 years. That was my favorite gig of all times because um, I got to, to wear things I wouldn't normally wear on stage, showgirl outfits and things like that that I would normally wear on stage. I could have been a carny. I could have been a carny. But trust me, I loved it. I would get out there every night and have the time of my life because when you're when you're doing a show like I do on main stage, you might do it like this. I suppose we did one time, one night. So you either did it right or it didn't happen. So it was always very stressful. It was never like really fun. It had to be done several, but the fair was 12 to 17 days, depending on how long they were going to have it. And we were at, we had three out three 45 minute shows a night, and we were like, you know. We were the it. And so it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I loved it. And there's a picture of that too. I have uh, the showgirl thing going on with, and that, with that, again, we had normally three singers, maybe four, 
and there was always four dancers. And they the dancers would come and go, but there would be four dancers every time and musicians, of course, because I always played with live musicians. I don't know how to sing with playback. I'm sorry. I don't. Uh-huh. <laughs> but anyway, but that was that was a tremendous amount of fun. Tremendous amount of fun. We it sounds like a lot of spontaneity that. that you could do you could change things up where you a lot. the regular production. So a lot. I would sometimes one time I, I my sound man didn't turn my microphone off and I said something I shouldn't have said backstage in my trailer, no less. And the sound man jumped across the, the place and turned my microphone off. And then uh, one of the singers was coming on to sing a love song after that. And he sang it to my husband and something like, you know, you better watch out, you know, that kind of thing. And he said to him, you better watch out <laughs> because I had already taken off on a tangent somewhere. But anyway, that those are fun things that would happen all the time, really and truly. Sounds great. <clears throat> and this was all in the midst had, of the, uh, the state fair. Uh, absolutely. So they had a Every million night. things going, you, huh? Yeah, you could smell the corn dogs. You could the people would come by with their beers and their this and their that, and uh, it was it was great fun. It was great fun. I loved it. Uh, maybe we could go back to the the Broadway shows again, uh, because you've mentioned a number of shows that uh, people are familiar with and love, like The King and I, and uh, and all that. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about those individual productions and. How you saw them is different Certainly. doing, uh, you know, Sound well, of Music as compared to The King and I and things like that, where, where you enjoyed yourself. Well, I have a, pardon me, all of a sudden I have something in my throat. I think I have, I have a picture of Camelot, which is great fun. Great fun. Um, I had a wonderful baritone. May he rest in peace. He, had, he died last year of complications from COVID. Um, but he was a wonderful baritone, and we did several shows together. We did Camelot, we did um, Evita. Uh, we uh, we did quite a few things together. So anyway, Camelot. I loved Camelot. Music is beautiful. The costumes are to die for. I loved wearing the crown. I loved being the queen. And it's a great story. It's a love story, but it's also a story about duty and love. And in the end, you see where duty overcomes the love the love story that develops in Camelot at the end. So that's a lovely story. Um, And there's a picture of that there. And uh, I have in King and I. King and I is a beautiful story as well. And of course, it's so much fun uh, working with the children. And because I am a teacher by profession, uh, I was really the one that was, you know, getting the kids to stay with it, so to speak, and to be able to, to, to relate to me and whatever. Which is something else I want to I want to touch on. I love being a performer, and it's it's a wonderful part of my life and uh, and everything. But everybody doesn't make it big. Like I never made it big. I made enough money to have a good time to go to Europe every other year, every year, whatever. But I always tell young people today, even if you are fabulously wonderful, less than one tenth of one percent make it big, and it doesn't have anything to do with your talent. It has to do with being at the right place at the right time and being just lucky enough to be that person. So I always tell young people, when you're going to get your degree, get your degree in something you can use in the future, something that you can always go back to. Like I have a master's in education and I retired from the school system as a a resource teacher. Uh, My husband was an administrator with the school system. He retired as an administrator. But we still enjoy the art, the arts. And I and I like to impress upon young people that you can't, or I don't think, that it's wise just to forego an education to be in the arts. I think you have to do both. I, just, just my personal opinion. I'm sorry if I got off topic, but it's just an opinion I have. A lot of young people are out there looking at it. And I think that's really an important uh, <laughs> thing to stress, the fact that uh, so few people uh, can make it big or even comfortable, even, even right. being comfortable. Never my friends drove cab for many years, never quite made it over in Broadway. Uh, they waited on tables. Uh, they were setting up behind the bar and somehow it just never happened, which was unfortunate because they were very talented people. But like you say, talent doesn't get you, doesn't guarantee that no. you're gonna be able to make a living or even no. be comfortable with no. that. But it's, it's joyous 
when you can do it and not have to worry about that. So I was just going to say, why don't, why don't we go to Evita? Because I know that's a very special show for you. You just mentioned that. It's and a wonderful. It's a wonderful show, wonderful show for me. I, I loved it because she's a powerful woman. The uh, night that it came out on the Tonys and they did the, uh, the bedroom scene at the end of Act One, the uh, new Argentina, that one, I turned to the director of the Spanish Lyric Theater and I said to him, I have to do that show. And uh, then that year it came to Lakeland Civic Center and I, and I went to see it and I said, I have to do that show. And the next year I did that show and I did it that year and I did it again 10 years later and I loved it. Uh, any particular song in Envita that you really enjoyed singing during the production? Of course, Don't Cry For Me Argentina is like the it song. I mean, you're up on the balcony and and and, and you're, you're doing your thing and your arms are out and you're, you know, talking to the people and... It's wonderful. It's, it's it's really a fabulous, fabulous song. But, you know, Evita is an opera. I think there's like two spoken words in Evita. It's an opera. It's not bel canto, but it's an opera. And it's a fabulous show. It really is. Well, what you were saying is that, you know, it's such an uh, emotional moving show that the audience must have given you great response to that. And you, tell us a little, bit, a little bit about how you it, felt when the audience just came to you and you know, and was with you during that song. Well, let me tell you, it wasn't necessarily that song, but in my death scene at the end of the show, there's a death scene where she dies and she's in the wheelchair and she's, you know, I had to let it happen, that, that kind of thing. And there was this woman in the third row and she starts to wail, I mean, cry. And her husband had her, whoever she was with, took her out because she was wailing because of my death scene. I thought, oh my goodness, I must have done this right because she, you know, <laughs> and of course I didn't really, I couldn't react to anything like that, but I thought, wow, but it's a very powerful show. I love it. I love the show. Let's, let's talk a bit about audience. <laughs> audience is really feed, feed off of, uh, you know, when I'm on stage and the audience is with you, it just is such a high. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the shows that you really connected with the audience, and, you know, and uh, how they made you feel. Because it certainly was a big thing for me with the few times I was on stage. Well, there was one funny situation. <clears throat> the theater had had auditions for a chorus line. And they'd produced a chorus line before, and it was magnificent. The cast was magnificent. And they had held auditions for a chorus line. And of course, the cast just wasn't going to make it. It just, it didn't happen. We couldn't find the people to do a chorus line. So the director said, let's just do, here, let's do Gigi. I said, okay, let's do Gigi. It was, we thought it was going to be a filler show. Let's do Gigi. Okay. It was beautifully done. I played the grandmother. And we said, okay, okay, Kurt shows over, curtains up. Da, da, da. We go out for our curtain call thinking it's just going to be a curtain call. We're going to say, yeah, get out. People were standing up and we thought, oh my God, what? <laughs> we couldn't believe it because it wasn't, we thought it was a filler show and it turned out to be a great show as far as the audience was concerned. And we never really could figure out why, except that they just liked it, I guess. I don't know, but it was, it was a real big surprise for us for that to do that. It was a surprise, a really surprise. So when you played great. when you played the multiple performances and you sort of got used to the audience really being with you, did that energize you? Did that make you feel, uh, you know, really great mm -hmm. about going out on the stage that night for to do the show? Well, there were some shows that we could only do one night. She was one of those. Like I said, oh. it was a filler show. We oh. didn't tra we didn't travel with that one. The ones that we traveled with, we were able to really enjoy and and every audience was completely different. Uh, different people would people would react to different parts of the show differently. So you never really knew how they were going to react. So it was always a surprise. Um, but yeah, uh, that particular one, there were some shows we only did once. Other shows we would travel with, uh, but that one was just once. Traveling ones were the ones that we would say, well, let's see what happens tonight, what they're going to think about it, that kind of thing. And it would always be different. So it was it was interesting. 
I have a couple of funny stories, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, I had one. I was doing The Merry Widow, and we were getting ready to do Velia. And there's a short, like an interlude of music and a blackout, and the curtain comes down, and the, all, the uh, chorus members all sit around because we're going to do Velia. And the choreographer was supposed to twirl me around and whatever. And my dresser was pulling the zipper off on my dress and the zipper broke. And she says, I don't have time to even pin you into this because the, the curtain was going to go up and, and the music was starting and I had no way to, to get out of it. So I put my arms around my body like this and I could only gesticulate with my, with my hands going up this way and that way. And I said, thank God I was not body mic in those days. And I said to the choreographer, don't twirl me around. And he said, okay. And I walked out and the chorus was like mortified because they could see that my dress was completely open in the back and they were saying, oh my God. So anyway, I did that number. It was hysterically funny. In the end, we laughed about that because it was, it was funny. It's something that just happens and you've got to be able to go with the flow. You just have to go. You can't stop the show and say, wait a minute, my zipper's broken. You have to go on and do it. Regardless, if you had to go out there without your clothes on, you'd go out without your clothes on, but you have to go out. <laughs> so that was funny. That was funny. And That's interesting. Terrific. You know, we may be running out of, uh, uh, you know, toward the end of the show. So uh, I would like to go <laughs> to uh, Man of La Mancha, if that's okay with you, because that was okay. such a terrific show. And uh, uh, I know it was one of your favorites. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about that? And uh, then I'd was hoping that we could sort of finish with you reading the uh, the lyrics for the impossible uh, because like absolutely I said, the uh, the there is a picture of that as well by the way uh, but anyway um, La Mancha is a wonderfully inspirational show because it starts out of course you, you understand that it's Cervantes and he's in the in the uh, jail and he's acting out his book and so forth and so on and Aldonza who is the uh, Gallery maid, or if you will, in, in the in the story, she uh, she he tries to make her into a lady, and she balks at him the whole time. And then when he's dying, she's finally believing her that she can be better than what she is. And so in the end, in this in the story, of course, she believes it, and he dies. And that's when she comes back at the end of the story, and she sings that beautiful number. Uh, and it's gorgeous. And I'm I'm only sorry that I couldn't get the clip to you because that's a pretty clip. You would have enjoyed the clip. So anyway, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful show. I love it. Very inspirational, especially when you're down and you need that extra push to get you up. It's a wonderful, wonderful show. Very inspirational. Let me tell the audience before you read the uh, the lyrics. Uh, Mary and I talked about this because both our cities have gone through, both our areas have gone through really difficult times. Uh, the wildfires out in Ma wildfires out in Maui uh, and uh, the hurricane Adelia coming through uh, and attacking Tampa right where Mary lives uh, at that eastern seaboard city. It's been very difficult for all of us and so many people are feeling down like Mary says are feeling that it's life is so heavy and uh, this song especially of all the songs that Mary and I talked about was the one that uh, is a song of hope. And Mary and I wanted to dedicate this, uh, you know, the reciting of the lyrics to all the people in Maui and uh, and Tampa and all the places that have been affected by some of these disastrous climate changes. So, so with that, for all you people, uh, let me turn it back to Mary to uh, take us through the impossible. This is for you. I know that you are not forgotten. And we are thinking of you to dream the impossible dream, to fight the unbearable foe, to bear with unbearable sorrow and run to where the brave dare not go, to right the unrightable wrong and to love pure and chaste from afar, to try when your arms are too weary to reach the unreachable star. This is my quest to follow that star, no matter how hopeless, no matter how far, to fight for the right without question or pause, 
to be willing to march into hell for that heavenly cause. And I know, if I'll only be true to this glorious quest, that my heart will lie peaceful and calm when I'm laid to my rest. And the world will be better for this, that one man, scorned and covered with scars, still strove with his last ounce of courage to reach the unreachable star. Really appreciate you being on the show and sharing with us uh, the joy of this performance. Thank you. It, it was my pleasure. And thanks to all of you who tuned in. Uh, and thanks to the staff at Think Tech Hawaii, to Jay and Haley and Michael and Carol. And uh, we hope you join us in two weeks because we're going to continue to look at some of the some of the subjects that may be helpful in these trying and hard times. And in two weeks, we'll be talking about loss and grieving and how to deal with that and find happiness despite the Thank you all for being with us. Aloha. <laughs>